Good morning, everybody. How are you? I love this weather today. It's nice and cool. It's, it's beautiful. Where was this weather two weeks ago when we had camp meeting, right? When we, had the sur we were on the surface of the sun. But this is really nice today. Beautiful day. And uh, anyway, I am excited. I don't know if you realize this, but... But millions of our Jewish friends and Christian friends this weekend are celebrating Rosh Hashanah, otherwise known as the Feast of Trumpets. And this is really the launch, if you will, of the fall feasts. And if any of you are, are know anything about that, it's, uh, this is in many ways some of the feasts that are of the, of the greatest weight and and the way it would be launched is someone would come with a big shofar and they would blow the shofar. I've tried to blow a shofar, but it didn't work. But it turns out Nick's here. He's got a trumpet here and he's going to blow a trumpet here for us. Just so let's see how he does here. Get ready. If you're if you're if you're worried, he's going to might want to, you know, plug your ears. So we're going to but we're going to. Celebrate. This is a time where we're launching into a season of introspection, but also a time of freedom and celebration of freedom. So let it go. Here we go. Let it rip. Yeah. Sound like a shofar. Yeah, all right. See, that's what I love about new creation. You never know what you're going to get. So anyway, happy Feast of Trumpets. And it actually began at, at sundown yesterday. It ends on Sunday at sundown. And uh, God is super, super good. Do you know that? How many have found that to be true? Oh, so good. At, after church today, stick around because we're going to have a baptism. And it'll be just right outside in our, our very classy baptistry, which is a horse trough. But we've ha baptized quite a few people with that. And uh, so we want you to come. And uh, where's Bev? Is she here? Bev's right here. So Bev, who's been a part of our church family, actually for quite some time, you just... You just haven't had a chance to uh, get to know her because she's been online. She's from Colorado. She's been watching online. We have a lot of people who are very much a part of our church family, but they're on our online family, and she's going to be rebaptized today, immediately after church. I'm so excited about that. So hallelujah. I want to invite Virginia to come up. And we're going to find out what good is going on in our church, because I know there's a lot of good happening. How are you doing, Virginia? Oh, I see some hands right there. Let's start with you. I have eight more classes, and then I graduate college. Ooh. That's a big deal. Fantastic. Oh, run clear over here. Paula's hand is up. This whole row had our hands up, but anyway, um, this is my girlfriend, Bev, that Pastor Mike was just talking about, just wanted you. Um, she's been here all week, and we've had a wonderful week, so God is blessing. Fantastic. Amen. And we're so happy to see you. You have quite a testimony, don't you? And Paula forgot to mention that Bev is my niece. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the most important and, thing, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, she, and she and Paula are sisters in Christ. Fantastic. Amen. Very, very close sisters in Christ. Absolutely. <laughs> I saw lots of hands, so put one up. Where did I not see a hand? Right over here, I see Preston's hand. I got a new phone this week. 
Wow. Yeah, he did. <laughs> praise the <laughs> Lord, that's praise right. The, praise the Lord is right. <laughs> uh-huh, that's quite a story. Yes, absolutely. All kids have to have phones, right? Arlie's hand is up. Who? Front row. Oh, front row. Right up here, front row. Hold it up high, Arlie. There you go. We had a great small group discussion. I just really enjoyed getting together. We had about eight of us there, and just a good time. Amen. Fantastic. How many of you were involved in a small group starting this week? Raise your hand. Good, quite a few. Very I'm, good. So, And we still have actually some room on Tuesday night, so if you have time on Tuesday at 6, make sure to talk to either myself or Pastor Dana or talk to Howie and Holly. How many did you have? We had four in our group. That's, a good, that's a good yeah, number. Which is good, room. but we want more. You want more. Oh, right here, a hand is up. And I don't know your name. I apologize. It's Jim. Jim? Yes. Good. My son last winter decided it was his last Minnesota winter, and he's moving here at the end of the month. Yeah. Him, and, him and his wife, so I'm very happy. Very good. There's a praise, isn't it? Anyone else? How about prayer requests this morning? Nick? We need a microphone. Yeah, we need a mic, sorry. My nephew uh, was in a motorcycle accident in Sioux City this past week, and um, his arm is, um, left arm, has got a lot of gravel in it, and they don't, they don't know if he's out of the woods and can keep his left arm yet, but they've done two or three surgeries and cleaned the gravel out, and but <clears throat> you know he's conscious and everything, so. Matt Struble is his name, so he needs our prayers. Okay. We'll take that prayer request. Priscilla, you're going to take it, right? Patricia. It starts with a P, doesn't it? That's right. It's in the ballpark. It's in the ballpark. Once it gets in there, it stays. <laughs> Patricia, right? Okay, Patricia. And I'll have to come up with a way to remember that. Everybody else carries signs name on absolutely absolutely who else prayer request right up in front Derek up here Derek is here thank you I am going in for double carpal tunnel surgery on Monday oh and um, yeah I just need prayers for that <laughs> okay and who will take that prayer request and they'll pray all week for that situation and Trina is going to take that request and it, yes, Angel, clear up here, second row. There you go. Well, many of you know that Taven's been dealing with some health challenges for about the last couple of years, actually, and he's doing better now than he was a year ago, but he still battles things. In fact, about for five weeks, he's had a cold that he can't shake and now a sprained ankle and deals with fatigue and stomach issues. So just keep praying that we can find answers for him, please. Find some answers. Absolutely, and he'll take that prayer request. Oh, Michelle, you're going to take that request. Any additional requests? Yes, Josie, tell us about Sam. How's he doing? I would like to thank my church family. They've held us up in, in prayer. It's a miracle that Sam is still with us. Amen. A couple of times it was very scary, <laughs> but... Um, I do want to say that they were waiting for, uh, for him to be able to swallow because the, the West Nile just literally shut, <laughs> practically shut him down. But anyway, um, he passed the swallow test yesterday. Wow. Woo! So our next step is, it looks like he may be dismissed uh, maybe Wednesday. And we're hoping to go to... Um, South Lake. Uh huh. We'll see. That's a great. Question. And who'll yes. take that prayer request? Oh, Jesse, you're going to take that and uh, pray that he'll get. There'll be an opening there at South Lake for him, or South Lake Village. 
Mm-hmm. Additional prayer request. I did get a notice on my phone yesterday that Ron Billoff is back in the hospital with some heart issues. Mm. Do I have someone that will take that request? Yes. Way in back. It's Dana. Dana. What's your Dana? Okay, Dana's going to take that request, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) (laughs) Can you see that far? I can see that far. I can see that far. You can see that far. You've got to help me with names if you can see that far, okay? But don't count on me to come up with names on the spot. (laughs) Howie, I've just learned your name. (laughs) (laughs) Eventually. I know. (laughs) I know. It's okay, isn't it? Let's bow our heads. Kind Father, you know you're so good to us. You give us life, you give us health, you give us strength, you give us hope, hope for a better future. Father, we love you. We can't wait for you to come and take us home. Be with us here, though. Comfort us, guide us, give us wisdom, give us strength. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You know, there aren't enough songs from the book of Job A song that I love is Blessed Be Your Name, whether you're in a season of joy or a season of pain and suffering. The response should be the same, Blessed Be Your Name. I'd like to have you stand and let's sing this together. Blessed Be Your Name. And when we get to the chorus, just throw your head back and let's just worship Him today. Everyone, here we go. Blessed be. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Everybody, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will stay. Blessed be the name. 
We are honored that you call us to worship you in spirit and truth. And Father God, what an honor it is also to be here with other believers. Father, I pray that you will be glorified in everything we do. Be glorified in our singing and in our fellowship, in our even our snacks and in our message today. Lord, I pray that every single person who is here will leave having heard from your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you so much that in good times and bad, in times of suffering, in times of immense joy, you are king. You are God, and we worship you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you sometimes have a tough week? Anybody? If you do, this is a, one of those soundtrack songs because when you're in the car, in the shower, and you're just thinking, Lord, I need a little help, this is a good one to sing that says, the battle belongs to the Lord. Let's do this one together.
been working our way through the book of First Peter, the letter of First Peter, and he has one theme going through the entire letter, and it's suffering. How many of you have ever suffered before? Got a few. And I think we all have suffered. But Peter's message is be of good cheer, be of good courage. I was praying once, I'm like, Lord, what would you say to a congregation that is suffering? What would you say to those who are suffering? And uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it's one of those moments where I think I got an answer. So if you know this one, sing with us, everybody. Come as you are. There is a place for you. Oh, so much grace for you. And comfort it brings. Come as you are. You'll find renewal here. Warmth and approval here. Under my I am the God of the broken, lay every hurt at my peace, dreams that lie shattered or incomplete, failure too deep to be spoken, for I am the God of the broken, come bring all your broken to me. Bring all your broken to me. Come as you are. You can reside in me. Heal and confide in me. Because I'm always I'm excited about heaven. I'm really excited about being in the throne room and singing, worshiping the Father. And I don't know what the music's going to sound like, but Revelation has given us a hint of the lyrics. 
And so I want to invite you to stand and let's sing this song together. And it's just the words that I think we'll be singing there in the throne room. There we go, everyone. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
I've been reminded a couple times the last few weeks just about the value of the body of Christ. Sometimes when friends or family can't be there for us, there's somebody in the body of Christ that can be there for us to help us carry our burdens. And this week I was on a phone call with somebody that lived in another state doing some phone counseling for them. And the words that they used to describe their life circumstances in the path of obedience um, was, I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I'm drowning. And right then, one of the church members here sent me a text message with some Bible verses that were perfect for it. And I'm going to read them, but before I do, this morning I was reading about Jesus, and he uses the words overwhelmed. His soul was overwhelmed with grief and sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he wasn't there with his mom and his brothers and sisters. He was there with the disciples. And he said, and he was going before the Father, and he said to them, Be with me. Pray with me. He was overwhelmed. He was sorrowful. Looking at the path of surrender, not seeing the glory, looking at what his friends would go through as he went through this and worried for them and looking out for me and you, he was overwhelmed to the point of death. It's okay to be overwhelmed. It's okay to feel the feels that come with everything we go through in life. And God gave us the body of Christ to press into, to carry one another's burdens, and to help, and he gave us himself. And the Bible verses that came in right in the right time with the right words from another church member said in Psalm 16, 6, your pleasant path leads me to pleasant places. I'm overwhelmed by the privileges that come with following you. And Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God longs to fill us and fill our situations with himself and with each other. I'll pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you you didn't count it anything to come down here and help us, that you suffered so that we wouldn't have to be alone, that you would make a way for us through everything, that we're more than conquerors, even if it's dark, for a season, even if it's hard for a season. I thank you for each person here, Lord, that you are using to minister to each other here and to help and to strengthen and encourage. And Father, even now, uh, I just ask that you continue to turn our hearts to you and the other areas where we may be hungering and thirsting for human help, but you alone can provide that relief, that comfort, that that encouragement, that need. But God, that you would also open our eyes um, to see where help comes from in the body of Christ and give us the boldness to ask when we might not otherwise ask. So I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite our deacons to come forward. And it's an important time of our worship. It really is. It's a time. This isn't, this isn't the collection time. This is a worship moment where we literally say, Lord, thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for all that you do for me. Here's something I would like to just return. And so the loose offering that goes in the little baskets It goes to the ministry of our church, but we are a part of a global church. If you'd like to give your tithe, we have tithe envelopes in the back. You can also give online at newcreation.community, and you can actually give to specific ministries in our church. So thank you. Thank you for being generous. Let's ask the Lord to do what he loves to do, and that's to take this and grow it. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you give us such good gifts. You overwhelm us with your gifts. And I just pray that you will take this offering that we're about to collect, that you will expand it, that you will grow it, that you will, like the the boy with the fish and the loaves, be amazed at what, what you can do with a little And Father, I pray that you will use it to expand your kingdom. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I'd like to invite all the kids to come forward. We have a story, and not just a story. We have a story from Uncle Howie today, which uh, he would like to be called Uncle Howie from now on. <laughs> so if you could please oblige in that. Not only that, we'd like to invite any, any grown-ups who identify as kids. Come on up. We don't have Pastor Frank this week because he is in Broken Arrow Ranch with all the Pathfinder leaders. So come forward and we got a neat story from Uncle Howie. Hello. There is a story that I love to tell about a dirty and lazy old man who used to live in a dirty old cabin away on the side of a hill in a country far, far away. This man was called a hermit because he didn't like to live with people. He just liked to live all by himself, and he ate just a little bit of food, just as little as he could, so that he wouldn't have to work any more than he had to. And he never swept his house, and he never washed his clothes, and he never pulled the weeds from his garden. He just slept and slept and sat and sat in the sunshine nearly all the time. In the valley nearby was a beautiful city where the good king of the country lived, but the dirty old hermit was content to live all by himself, and only once in a while would he go to the city when it was necessary to sell a bundle of wood so that he could buy something to eat. One day he was sitting in the sunshine among the weeds when he heard a horse coming up. Cloppity, 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 clop. And he looked, and it was the king <coughs> riding his horse, coming closer and closer. And the king tied his horse to a post and walked towards the dirty old cabin. And he stood there, and he looked over the valley at the majestic mountains on the other side. And it was such a beautiful sight. And the king said that uh, as he looked at the, the mountains, he thought, I just love standing here. And I look across the mountains, and it makes me feel like I want to be a better man. And the hermit looked at the mountains. And when he moved, the king saw him. And the king said, Friend hermit, may I come again and look at these mountains? And the hermit poor old hermit. He didn't know what to say, and he, he bowed his head and looked down, and while he was trying to figure out what to do, the king went away. But he will come again. He said he would, and he will. And so the hermit uh, pulled the weeds from his garden, and he swept the path, and he, uh, he got a stool, and he fixed up his stool, and he set it out in the yard, and he waited for the king to come again. And one day, while he was waiting, he heard a horse coming closer, cloppity, 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 clop, and he looked, and it was, it was the king. And the king came, and he tied his horse to a post, and he walked over, and he sat on the stool, and he looked out over the valley, and he saw the mountains on the far side, and he, he said, friend hermit, Thank you for making this th this way and for setting out this stool. Uh, on my ride, I have become thirsty. Do you have a glass of water? Poor old hermit. He couldn't tell the king that his cup was dirty and that his bucket was empty and that the spring was muddy and all grown up with weeds. And he ran and got his glass. And while he was trying to wash it, the king went away. But he will come again. He said he would, and he will, and I must be ready for him. And so the hermit, uh, and so the hermit got his spring all cleaned up, and he washed his glass, and he filled his bucket with water, and every day he would set a full bucket of water on the table, and he would put a table out by the stool. He put the full bucket of water on, and he put the cup out there, and he waited for the king to come again. And one day he heard a horse. What did the horse say? Cloppity, 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 clop. And he looked, and it was. It was the king. 
And the king tied his horse to a post, and he came close, and he sat down on the stool, and he drank a cool glass of water, and he said, thank you, thank you, friend hermit. This is so wonderful and so nice, and it feels so good to be up here and look at the beautiful view. It makes me feel like I want to be a better man and a better king. And then the king said, you know, hermit, on this ride, I've gotten tired and hungry. I wonder, do you have a piece of bread? Poor hermit. All he had to eat was a couple of crusty cr crusts and a couple of old grapes. And he went into his, his old cabin to see if he could find anything for the king. And while he was in there trying to figure out what to do, the king went away. But he will come again. He said he would, and he will. And when he comes, I must be ready for him. And so he uh, cut down a bundle of wood, and he took it into town, and he brought, bought some cornmeal, and he took it home, and he made some corn cakes. And he put out the corn cakes on the table with the water, and he kept his water ready and his bucket ready, and he kept the corn cakes ready. Every day he would cook for him. And one day he heard a horse coming. What did the horse say? Cloppity, 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 clop. And it wa he looked, and it was the king. He was coming again. And the king came, and he sat down on the stool, and he drank cool water, and he ate corn cakes, and he looked at the beautiful view, and he said, wow, what a beautiful view. I love coming here. It makes me want to be a better man and a better king. You know, friend hermit, it would be so wonderful to sleep with here with you and to see the sunrise come up over this beautiful valley. Poor old hermit, he didn't dare tell the king that he didn't even have a bed and all he slept on was an old pile of rags and he went into the house to see what he could do and while he was there, the king went away. But he will come again and I must be ready for him. And so the old hermit sold some more logs in town and he bought... Uh, some poles, and he made a bed for the king. And then he bought some more poles, or bought some more, cut down some more wood, and he bought some uh, some bedding and a mattress to make for the king. And then he realized that his clothes were all dirty and yucky, and he wanted to look better than that. So he sold some more wood, and he bought some fresh new clothes. And every day, he wore his new clothes, and he realized that his house was all dirty, and so he swept it all out, and he made it all clean and neat. And every day he would get water from the spring and he would make corn cakes and he would put on his fresh clothes and he would sweep out his house and he would weed the garden and make it ready for the king to come. And one day he heard the king in a, riding on a horse. And what did the horse do? It went cloppity, 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 clop. And he looked and it was the king. The king was coming and the king came and he sat down on the stool and he drank the cool water and he ate the corn cakes. And he looked out at the view, and he said, oh, it's so lovely. And that night, he slept in the house of the old hermit. And in the morning, they got up, and they saw the sunrise together. And it was so wonderful. And, you know, at the beginning of the story, the people called him an old hermit. But now, when he, now because the king and him would spend so much time together, they called him the friend of the king. That's the end of the story. Thank you for listening. <coughs> I love that. Thanks, kids. You can have it go to your seat. You know, during Rosh Hashanah, I've been told, Greg Firth told me this, that the proper way to greet each other during Rosh Hashanah is to say, may your name be written on the book of life. So look for someone beside you, in front of you, behind you, just greet them, introduce yourself, and say, may your name be written on the book of life. Oh, 
so many people I'm happy to see today. All of you I'm happy to see. Happy to see Nick and Becky. I'm happy to see Kevin in the back there. They, good to see you. So happy. Happy to see. I'm happy to see uh, Grace and Aaron's baby. You can't see the baby. It's just a lump right now, but it's coming. God is, God is in our fellowship, and I love that. So we have been working our way. If you've been coming here, you've been keeping up with us, you've been working with us. We've been going through the letter that Peter wrote to the Christians throughout the Roman Empire, Christians who have been persecuted and who are suffering. And we're going to continue with that study. But I want to try something a little different today. And I got this idea from Holly, Holly Huntsman, where she said she always loved it in her church when before they would read the scripture, everybody would stand. And I thought, that's a wonderful idea. So I'm going to invite you to stand with me, and I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 to 22. And you can see it right there on the screen. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Peter writes, For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for evil. For Christ also suffered once for all sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight and all, were saved through the water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. Hallelujah. Pray with me. Father God, as we delve into this challenging piece of scripture, this challenging portion of the letter from Peter, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, that your Holy Spirit will, will give each person here the exact message that he or she needs to hear today. Even if that's a different message for everyone. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I like that, Holly. You know, as a young boy in the church of the 1970s, I lived in a demon-haunted world. And some of you can relate. I grew up in a pretty conservative church. And back then, I didn't actually know there were any other kinds. I listened to the grown-up conversations in and out of church. And Satan and his devil seemed always near. Always ready to attack and always overpowering. Meanwhile, God's angels always seemed handicapped for some reason by rules I didn't understand. For example, I was taught that angels couldn't enter the bowling alley. But the devils could. And that worried me because my mom, always living on the edge, was a part of a women's bowling league. Nor could angels enter the smoking section of Denny's or any other diner because apparently angels are allergic to smoke. The first time my Southern Gospel singing family performed in a Sunday keeping church, I was afraid. And I'm very embarrassed of this. The people were so kind and they were so Jesus like. But that didn't stop me 
from scrubbing my forehead and hands that night to remove any traces of the mark of the beast. I lived in a demon-haunted world. I was told the angels couldn't follow me into the theater. Of course, the demons could. Were they stronger? I mean, when I went to my first theater movie, which was a cute little cartoon called Snoopy Come Home, I felt the need to repent, and I did over and over and over. I lived in a demon-haunted world. No one forced this fear on me. It was a fear that just simply permeated the air. It was a worldview that was embedded in little phrases the preacher would say, or that my teacher would say, or the adults around me would say. As a boy, I imagined the great conflict between God and Satan as a clash between two nearly equal forces in power and influence. I lived in a demon-haunted world, and I was afraid. As a grown-up, I mean of sorts, <laughs> I still view suffering and pain as inescapable and the cosmic clash between good and evil, between God and Satan, between light and dark. I believe the war, the war is real. Jesus said as much. But what I didn't understand as a boy, and Peter wants us all to grasp, is how we have absolutely no reason to fear. None. The suffering is real. The pain is real. And we do live in a demon-haunted world. But as Peter's best friend put it, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So where did this fear come from? Well, the most influential literary crit critic, of, in my opinion, of the 20th century is Harold Bloom. And he wrote a book in 1992 called The American Religion. Bloom was not a believer, though I think he was a nominal Jew when he was growing up. In his book, he set out to interpret American-born Christian movements, such as Mormonism or Pentecostalism, in the same way one might interpret Shakespeare or Charles Dickens. Could one analyze Southern Baptists or Christian scientists in the same way one might analyze a book by Jane Austen? Bloom asked the questions of each of these Christian groups, questions one might actually ask of a short story or a novel. What is the plot of their story? What is the setting of their worldview? How do their overarching narratives affect how they interpret the rest of the Bible? How does their story affect their day-to-day -day lives? As a graduate student, I was utterly fascinated by this approach. Then I came to the chapter that he wrote on Seventh-day Adventists. And he analyzes the great story we call the Great Controversy, or the Conflict of the Ages. Now, nearly all of Christianity shares aspects of this epic, but few emphasize it quite like we do, especially the apocalyptic aspects of the story. For the most part, Bloom gets the story right. Lucifer rebelled against the Maker, a mystery we may never comprehend. And in his revolt against Almighty God, he took with him a third of the angels. He deceived Eve and Adam, took dominion over earth, and brought sin and doubt and death to our world. The story sounds familiar, doesn't it? But God, in his mercy, rather than scrapped the whole project like we probably would have done, willingly died on a cruel cross to save his beloved children. And he did all of this for the most incomprehensible reason. He did it for love. Love for each of us while we were, we were still his enemies. Now, Bloom rightly noted how this great story 
this remarkable story really is embedded in our spiritual DNA. But as a skilled reader of stories, Harold Bloom expressed an acute concern for Adventists and their overarching story. Bloom argues that there's a potential danger in how we imagine the conflict between God and Satan. The danger lies in our imagining Satan as a genuine rival to God. We run the risk of imagining Satan as a near equal to Yahweh, as a force whose power is only slightly inferior to that of Almighty God. This is how I saw my universe as a boy and why I was afraid. Many still believe this. And Peter aims to put that fear to rest. In 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 17, Peter addresses a truth that his readers already know all too well, that suffering is very real. It's real, it's present, it's severe, and it's very often scary. Even in our preposterously comfy world, we all know some suffering. But few of us, few of us have actually suffered, and I mean really suffered because of our faith. Certainly not as the first century Christians suffered under Emperor Nero. Few Christians in North America have been forced to watch family members crucified or homes burned because of their devotion to Jesus. Few have had to flee their homes or their hometowns because of their faith. Quite the opposite. We live rather blissfully, I think, compared with most of the world. And let me just say, mean people on the internet do not count as persecution. Still, I'm aware that there are people here in this room who have lost jobs for their faith. Some have lost reputations and friends and family for their faith. But Peter comes armed with encouragement, so much encouragement. He writes, beginning with verse 17, For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. All right, so can we all just agree, by the way, that no sane person loves to suffer, right? If you do love to suffer, can I recommend that you uh, come see one of the elders after church? But I'm with Peter on this one. If I must suffer, it is far better to suffer for a purpose, for doing good, for Jesus and for his gospel, even if no one but God sees my sacrifice. Peter's off audience is suffering as few have. And all for the crime, if you want to call it a crime, of being faithful to Jesus and his gospel. Peter's been reminding them how and why their suffering has a purpose. The gospel is literally lighting the world on fire fire, not in spite of their suffering, but in many ways because of their suffering. But suffering is hard, which is, I think, why they call it suffering. And their neighbors, and their colleagues, well, they don't view their suffering as noble or brave. No one was buying the rights of their stories to make the movie out of it. Rather, these radical followers of the way were deemed by many as extremists, rabble-rousers, pot-stirrers, and fanatics. They needed to be eliminated, not tolerated. The purpose one finds in suffering is never in the accolades from others, because to be honest, those accolades rarely come. The purpose must always be Jesus and his suffering. And why should we be surprised at suffering when our God, our Savior, when Jesus suffered? Peter goes on. 
For Christ also suffered once for all sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. First, can I just say, hallelujah? Hallelujah. Jesus died with my sin nailed to him. He died with all sin nailed to him. He died so that who we were might die with him. Yet even in that, there is no despair. He rose again with his righteousness intact so that he might live in us. Righteousness and all. So that I could say, along with the Apostle Paul, that it, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Righteousness literally lives and breathes in me. A righteousness that is Jesus alone. This is the gospel, friends. This is the good news of Jesus. And I'm telling you, this news is so good that it's worth suffering in order to spread it. And therein lies the purpose of our suffering. The Apostle Paul took it a step further than Peter ever did because he said this. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Everyone. Now, Peter could have just ended his message right here, but he didn't. He could have ended with the amazing truth that through Jesus' suffering, there is purpose in our suffering. And because of the gospel, we never suffer in vain when we suffer for Jesus. And that would be a great message. He could have ended right there and made an awful lot of theologians happy. But instead, he added this seemingly cryptic passage. It goes like this. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. What? He went and made a proclamation to whom? To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. I want you to know I stand before you today a little humbled because Martin Luther, John Wesley, Karl Barth, my hero theologians, they all called this passage the most challenging in all scripture. So I say, piece of cake, bring it on. But let's decipher what Peter's talking about. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Now, what does Peter mean here? Is he preaching to the souls in hell, as some have believed? Well, many great theologians have put forward that interpretation. I humbly do not. Part of the confusion, I think, here lies in Jesus' proclamation in verse 19. In the old King James, it translates it as Jesus went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And that's not a bad translation. We almost imagine Jesus setting up an old evangelist tent. And there in like Billy Graham fashion, he preaches to the imprisoned spirits, followed by, I don't know, a, an, an altar call. But such an interpretation runs counter to the rest of Scripture. It also runs counter to the text itself. The word Peter uses here, the root word for the word proclamation, is kerygma. Kerygma. Try that. Say kerygma. See, look at that. You know Greek already. Such proclamations are, are somewhat foreign to our culture. However, I think that's largely because our information rarely comes to us from an official herald who enters our town with fanfare, maybe some trumpets, in order to pronounce kerygma. So it's hard to imagine what Peter's talking about here. But we do, in our culture, get the occasional breaking news, don't we? 
the sudden interruption of our regular programming for an important announcement? That would be kerygma. Jesus having suffered, as none of us will suffer, having laid down his life of his own accord, and having taken it up again of his own accord, now comes with breaking news, with kerygma. He makes a proclamation, a grand announcement. Something really, really big has taken place. Something so big that nothing will ever be the same. Something so big that it merits stopping everything else to proclaim the news, the kerygma. Now notice something, by the way, in our passage. Peter makes it clear how Jesus' announcement, his kerygma, is made after Jesus is resurrected. Not while he's still dead. Jesus makes a proclamation to our world but I'm calling our demon-haunted world. And I don't know how he did it. I don't know where he did it. But somehow Peter is suggesting that Jesus rose to life and then halted everything to make an announcement, a kerygma, a news alert to the imprisoned spirits. Now that seems straightforward enough, right? If we can only figure out who these imprisoned spirits are. Who is Jesus making this grand announcement to? Now, as always, Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. The expression imprisoned spirits is used only two other times in Scripture, and one is really only hinting at it, and that's in Jude and in Revelation, although the expression is found in a number of extra biblical sources. And notice this, every single time it's used, every time it refers to one thing, not to souls trapped in hell. Now the phrase refers exclusively to fallen angels, or if you prefer, to demons. In his moment of absolute victory brought about by his suffering, Jesus has a proclamation for Satan and his creepy cohorts. So if you are like me, you want to know what would Jesus have to say to a demon-haunted world at that moment? I'd like to be a fly on the wall and hear that. What would he have to say to the enemies of God who have caused more suffering than can be possibly imagined? Well, first, Peter reminds us that these imprisoned spirits, these instigators of so much death and pain and suffering on earth that these demons are part of a very long war. Going back, back, back to the earliest of days, back to creation, back to the opening chapters of Genesis, back to the flood. Peter writes, after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits to those who were disobedient long, long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. Now, I'm just going to say a great deal of theological ink has been spilt over that passage I just read. Did the demons have an opportunity to repent before the flood? The text is vague. But here's Peter's larger point. The war. And the war is real. The war has been long and it's been hard. And if you think it's bad now in our world... Let me tell you about the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6 describes a terrifying world in which demons ran unfettered and free before the flood. There were giants in the land called Gibra in Hebrew. And they, along with the Nephilim, seemed to have a run of the place. They interacted with humanity. 
They intermarried with human women and gave birth to superhuman children. I mean, it sounds a little bit like a fantasy novel, but this is scripture. This is the book of Genesis here. What a terrifying time, and I don't pretend to understand this. What are these terrifying creatures? Few agree, actually, except that they are all the products of wicked, demonic activity. Earth ran amok with evil. An evil that I actually believe will return. But something on earth had monumentally changed back then. But not only that, I would say everything kind of monumentally changed back then. It was a worldwide flood. And God sent someone to make a proclamation, a kerygma. He sent Noah. And now something bigger than a worldwide flood has come and God himself proclaims it. Jesus has come to announce to those same demonic forces from back in the day that something in the world has once again mon monumentally changed. Something in the universe has come and monumentally changed. Or I would put it this way, everything in the universe has monumentally changed. What has changed? Peter points out that a way has been made to salvation. Just as a way was made for Noah and his family. It is the saving work of Jesus made possible through his suffering. Much like the baptism of the flood, we are saved through baptism into Christ's blood. Peter writes, it saves you. Now he's speaking of baptism here, not, not the water. The water doesn't save you. It's, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. And here it comes. Here's the monumental change. Because it saves you by the res resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand get this part, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. That's it. And I think that's his proclamation. Having suffered, having conquered death, the cross, the grave, Jesus is alive forevermore. And apparently, one of his first acts after resurrection was to make a proclamation a kerygma to the imprisoned spirits, to Satan, to his devils, to all his minions. And the proclamation to the demons of hell is this. I win. I win and you lose. And now everything, angels, authorities, and powers are subject to to me. Jesus put it this way when speaking to the disciples. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go. Jesus is king. And not merely of this world. He is king of heaven. He is king of hell. He is king of the rising and falling empires, of news cycles, of persecutors, of pain and suffering itself. So be encouraged. Because Peter, Peter is reminding us of this. Be encouraged in the face of your worst suffering. Be encouraged and have no fear. Jesus is king and far more powerful than any suffering you or I may feel. Be encouraged. Jesus is king and we have nothing to fear of a so-called demon-haunted world. We have nothing to fear of those who can kill the body, but not the soul. His power succeeds all and it's not even close. Be encouraged. If, if such a God is for us, really, who can be against us? Whatever you're going through, whether you're suffering from health, 
suffering from relationships, from work, or suffering for your faith, I, as a devoted follower of Jesus the Messiah, I have a proclamation today. I have a proclamation to make to those who, like me as a boy, are afraid. Jesus commissioned us to go and make proclamations, to make charisma, to spread the gospel. Jesus told us to go. So unafraid to suffer on behalf of this proclamation, I have something big to announce. Are you ready? Everything has changed. We have a king. We have a king and angels and demons and authorities and principalities and powers and emperors and governments, all of them are subject to Jesus and Jesus alone, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That is his proclamation, and that's the proclamation he gives to us. And it is worth suffering to give that proclamation. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. Father God, we come before you today thankful for the words of Peter as he writes to Christians who are suffering incredible, incredible torments. And he is telling them to be encouraged. Father God, give us that same courage, a courage that helps us to realize that we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. We serve the King, the King of heaven, of hell, of principalities and powers. We serve the God and the King of our own suffering, our own stress. We serve the God who is king over sickness and death. He is our God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this encouraging message. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Even as Michelle's coming out, look at your neighbor and just tell them, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. We have a number of announcements in our time. We've kind of gone a little over, but we want to make these. So we're going to make them really quick because we want you to come join us. We're going to have a baptism. Peter was talking about baptism. And we're going to take Bev right out here, and we're going to have a little baptism. So those of you who can, come join us. We'll be just right on the other side of the church at the front end of the prayer garden, and we're going to have a baptism. So what do we have going today, Michelle? This afternoon, we have Lord's Place, and we are serving dinner at Lord's Place. such a fun, exciting journey to be studying it together. So we invite you to join us today at 530 Absolutely. And then at 6.30, so you can actually do both. It might be a little bit late, but that's okay. At 6.30, there's a joint Vespers with Holland Church, and the address is in your bulletin. Uh, it's a potluck and um, a Vespers that we're doing together with them. So they're our sister church, and we're just going to hang with them for a little bit. Also, tomorrow we have a baby shower for Jamie Doherty. And baby Morgan, we have Daddy over here with Ray, <laughs> and, uh, and this Grandma is going to take place at our house. <laughs> yes, it is, at and, 10 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. So please, come on over to our house at 10. Also, this year there are a lot of real big milestones with wedding anniversaries and such, and if you had a monumental wedding anniversary or occasion, we, I invite you to go find Pastor Dana. Where is she? Where is she? She's right over here. Because we want to we wanna put a little display out here and just celebrate you this year. Because October, we're celebrating families. So see her afterwards. We're going to celebrate that. Wednesday, we have Super Cow. Cow stands for Connecting on Wednesday. And we have three classes. Um, there's going to be a Bible study focused class, a music class, and a craft focused class. So come Wednesday, look for details and Facebook. 
Um, but that's a, and we also have Pathfinders. So Wednesday's a happening night that's here at right. New Creation. So the men's ministry on on not on Sunday, September twenty fourth. We're coming together. We're going to eat food, and the women on October oh. one are going to go hang out at the apple orchard, and they're going to bring food back to the men. <laughs> no, that's a different day. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, a little. So, you know, it's a neat thing for our women to come. You can see the posters. Please note those because. What a wonderful time of fellowship for our men and for our women. Also, we have... I think that's the last one. Oh, that's the last one. <laughs> so God is... I tell you, we, we went through those pretty fast. I tell you, be encouraged. If you're, if you're feeling a little discouraged, find someone here who's got a smile on their face and say, what, ask them, what's the secret? It's Jesus. We serve a king, a mighty, mighty king. I appreciate, I appreciate Peter's message in this. Let's pray. Father God, I pray a blessing on each one here. I pray a blessing that each one will go and just enjoy this beautiful gift of the Sabbath. I thank you so much for the gift of freedom that is celebrated in Rosh Hashanah. I thank you so much that our names are written in the book of life. And I thank you so much that we have nothing in this world to fear. Nothing. Because Satan is no rival to our God. Our God is mighty. He is the God of the universe. And he's the God of every little thing in our lives. Father God, thank you. We worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just going to let you know, we'd love to have you come. Just, just We're going right out there right now. We're not wasting any time. Come join us. Hi. One, right on the other side of the church here. Let's go baptize Ben. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every deed Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This 